So Pranandar and welcome to the Newport Centre. It is a bit like being at home. Um, I was chair of leisure services when this building was built and uh, <clears throat> I was telling Craig on the way here some of the things that happened. Like we have these bricks on the outside, we've never seen them before. Um, but there was a particular way to put them. They either look miserable or they look happy. Uh, so we actually went off to look at a wall that had been built. And you can imagine the front page of the Argus, can't you? Uh, committee going to look at a wall. It was, uh, and the story about the palm tree, we won't even go to now, but uh, interesting. Anyway, welcome. And this is the fifth and final of Women in Public Life regional event. And it's great to see you here today. And I'm delighted to be back here on my own patch. Uh, please um, help yourself to more coffee and tea. Uh, during the event. Don't feel you have to sit there. And please fe feel free to speak in Welsh or English as we do have simultaneous translation provided. And you have these. You just slot them in with that to the front, okay? Um, so before we get away and uh, underway with the session, I just wanted to say a few wo words of welcome and to put this event into context. Now, as you probably know, and many of you have been to the International Women's Day dinner, March the 8th is International Women's Day, and thousands of events are held throughout the world to inspire women and to celebrate women's achievements. Now, the date has been observed since the early 1900s, a time of great expansion and turbulence in the industrialized world. And that, and that time, of course, saw booming population growth and the rise of radical ideologies. Now, March the 8th is the day um, when we should all take time to reflect on the sacrifices made by women worldwide, who managed to bring positive changes for us all. But of course, one day a year is not enough. So during my term as presiding officer, one of the themes I'm concentrating on is equality. And this year, the focus is on women, and today's seminar will explore the barriers to women's participation and representation. Now, I've held a series of similar regional events across Wales over the past few months, which will culminate in the National Conference on November the 22nd at the Assembly. And I hope that that conference will build on the outcomes of each of the five events, and that it will task me and my fellow Assembly members with actions to ensure that the barriers to participation are hopefully finally removed. Now, the Assembly has a legal duty under the Government of Wales Act to promote equality. And I'm personally very pleased that this duty has been taken extremely seriously since the Assembly came into being in 1999. Delivering equality has become part of our custom and practice. And importantly, and some of you have heard me say this before, we do, don't do it because we have to. We do it because we want to and because it is the right thing to do. A couple of months ago, I had the great privilege of addressing a group of women from Libya and Jordan would come here to learn about what we do. And I can tell you it was a stark reminder of the continuing struggle to get women's voices heard in some parts of the world. Now I'm absolutely delighted that Shelley Bossom, who is the Chief Executive of Gwent Police, has kindly agreed to share today's session. I'm particularly grateful to her as she was called in at very short notice, as Carmel Napier, the Chief Constable, who was due to chair the meeting, has gone to Manchester to the funeral of the policewoman who was shot. So um, we're delighted that Shelley is able to be, is, is with us today. Now Shelley will introduce our panel, uh, who all continue to push at the artificial barriers that are put in the way of women in Wales. And I'm sure that when you've heard them, you will be inspired. Um, and then at the end, we will have a, a dialogue. And that's why we're not having very big events, because if you go to a big event, you feel you can't take part. And really, this is about trying to get a women who don't normally come to these kind of events having the opportunity to have your say. So enjoy the day. And Shelley, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I just wanted to um, extend a welcome to everyone here today, but also to start by thanking Rosemary for organising this event today and the others that she's um, organised across Wales and for her tireless work in um, relation to raising the issues relating to um, women in Wales, and particularly um, the role of women in public life, um, and keeping it on the agenda, because I think it's something that perhaps when we get to a certain point in our careers, we think, OK, we're there, but actually we do need to think about those people coming up behind us um, to ensure that we are inspiring them and giving them the confidence to go forward. Um, as you've probably gathered, I'm not Carmel Napier, um, Chief Executive. Uh, I'm Chief Executive at the uh, Police Authority. Um, I was saying to Rosemary, only for a couple more weeks because we're being replaced by Police and Crime Commissioners in the middle of November. Um, I've been at uh, the uh, Police Authority now for seven years. Um, I'm a solicitor by profession 
and um, worked part time, uh, work, worked in part private practice, and then moved over to local government. Um, oh, probably 20 odd years ago. I don't want to say too much. Um, so I took a particular career path. I, I thought I was going to be a solicitor and probably always thought I was going to be a solicitor in private practice. But opportunities came along um, at that time, um, just after I had my first daughter, actually, in 88. And um, they, they, I've been very fortunate, I think. I've been in the right um, uh, place at the right time. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed um, working in the public sector. Um, I think, hopefully, people on the panel today will be able to give you different um, aspects of how they've managed to get to the positions they've had. Um, how, how they've got, got over some of the barriers that they may have had. I think uh, uh, on a personal level, I'm not sure I would um, view any of the sort of hurdles I've got over as barriers in that sense, but I've always um, felt that I can possibly do a little bit better or I've been interested in things that have been coming, coming up and I've taken those opportunities. And I think it's about sometimes we need to... Um, make sure that we do grab those opportunities. I'm sure some of my colleagues here on the table will say, men tend to sort of go for it, and then they get in their interview and they bluff their way through it. We will tend to say, and I think we've all been in that situation, well, I can't possibly do that because I don't know enough. And I think actually it's about actually sort of getting yourself into that mindset, but you can achieve things. And also recognizing, I think, when we've got as far as we feel we are comfortable with, you don't have to be at the top of your organization to be successful. And I think that's, um, there's a lot also that we can engender in those people that work um, for us, with us, but also I think particularly in our, our children um, and um, young people. It's about that aspiration. Um, if that's enough from me, if I can just, um, I'll ask first of all Emma to say a few words. Emma is the Chief Executive and Director of Nursing at St. David's Foundation. Um, she obviously was a, a started her, her career as a, as a nurse and has just uh, explained to me that in fact she has a dual role at the moment, so she's um, still involved in the nursing angle as well as the, um, the, the more fundraising aspects of it. Um, Emma also sits on a number of UK palliative care committees and is a member of the editorial board of End of Life Care Journal. Perhaps you'd like to uh, carry on. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah. Oh, that's a microphone. Oh, you will be able to hear me now. Um, well, I'd just like to say thank you so much, Rosen, for inviting me today, and thank you, Shelley, for that introduction. Um, it really is um, quite an honour and pleasure to be asked, and um, it's really quite unusual to talk about yourself, actually. Um, so that was quite tricky for me to uh, think about what I was going to say today. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, how far should I go back? And I think many people that get to a, the position they wish to get into in life will look back to their childhood and see how that mapped their life for the future. And if I look back at mine, um, my passion for, for nursing and particularly cancer nurses started probably when I was um, a child. Um, unfortunately, when I was nine years old, my dad um, was diagnosed with cancer and uh, died when he, I was 11 years old. Um, but he was cared for at home by my mum. Um, and um, that was a very important part of my life, as you can imagine. But certainly taught me that um, people, um, when they're dying, they want to be cared for at home. And that always stuck with me. But the second thing that stuck with me was the fact that my mum had a career. And had she not have had that career, we would have been in a real pickle. So as time went on, I decided to become a nurse, and I qualified in 1990 in Cardiff and started my career in Valindra Hospital, which was indeed quite a baptism of fire. Um, it was a 36-bedded ward, and we had patients with um, having chemotherapy treatments. So one minute we were putting the chemotherapy up, other patients were having radiotherapy, and then probably in the cubicles you had a couple of patients who were dying. And when you were 24, 23, and looking after not just the patient but the families, um, it taught me a lot on a very busy, busy ward. But of course, you came up against lots and lots of different professionals when you're on that ward environment. And I always remember meeting um, a young doctor, I thought young, seemed young to me, uh, came up and I was terribly efficient and um, said, now you do know what you're doing, don't you, with this patient um, who had some um, radioactive implants. And he very nicely said to me, oh, oh, yes, I have been here for a while. I'm his consultant. Um, and that was something that um, stuck with me, <laughs> never to assume um, who somebody is. And in fact, um, we are um, great friends now, and he's actually on the board of St. David's Foundation, so um, he didn't hold it against me. I then left um, St. David's, um, sorry, Valindra, to become a clinical nurse specialist at St. David's Hospice Care, where I've been now for 18 years, a long time. And the reason I went to St. David's was because it was one of the only 
um, hospice at home services um, in the local area. And I really wanted to explore how we could keep people at home when they are facing a life-limiting illness. And so I worked very hard with my GPs in Monmouthshire who weren't used to having um, a young clinical nurse specialist working with them, probably having to um, help them along the way to keep their patients at home, to make sure they had the correct drug regimes prescribed, and making sure um, that if they were prescribing, they were prescribing in a way that was the most up-to-date and um, the best way to care for those patients. So that certainly was a huge learning curve for me. And I think for all of us, but it certainly um, was, was a case of women and men working together. But in medicine and nursing, that wasn't an unusual scenario. But even so, for a GP who'd worked in his area for a very long time, uh, to have somebody coming along um, and perhaps advising something they'd never heard of before needed a lot of trust and encouragement. And I think I learned from then that um, a lot of what I was doing was um, trying to empower other professionals to be secure and safe in what they did. During the time that I worked in Monmouthshire, I had um, two children, and while I was having my second child, I did my MSc in nursing. Um, the only reason I could do that and work full time was because my mum moved down from Herefordshire and retired from the career that she'd had. So very much um, I was nurtured, I suppose, by somebody who'd always had a career. But as I went on and worked for St. David's, I realised if I wanted to make a real difference, I'd have to move on. And the vacancy of Director of Nursing came up at St. David's Foundation Hospice Care, which I got in uh, 2001. And then I was able to influence the care that we provided throughout Monmouthshire, Torvine, Caerphilly and Newport. Um, and I was really keen that if we were to develop services, I now needed to work very hard and very... Um, in tune, really, with the senior managers in the NHS. And I really got my first taste of what it was like to be a third sector leader working with the NHS. And things then changed again, because in 2004, the chief executive post at St David's arose. And now I could really see what we needed to achieve. But even though I was director of nursing and I could influence hugely how we delivered patient care, it was going to be tricky unless I held the purse strings. And so I was very lucky um, to become chief executive and hold on to the post of director of nursing at the same time because I was desperate not to leave that patient contact, um, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, at that time, I was 37, so quite a young chief executive um, in a healthcare organisation. And before I, um, as I was preparing for today, I looked um, throughout Wales and um, noted that there's um, only two female chief, chief executives in the seven health boards in Wales and only one female chair. Out of the 14 hospices in Wales, there are only two chief executives and I'm one of them. Um, but more encouragingly, across the UK in hospices, there's a 50-50 split of women and female chief execs. I can't explain to you, really, how the last few years of being chief executive have changed me. I've met some most inspirational people, um, but also been quite disappointed, I think, um, how there's still a huge wall to climb between voluntary sector organisations and the NHS and making us credible within the NHS. Um, and these years have probably been my most challenging and most frustrating, because when you're having direct patient care, even how sad the situation is, there's a huge amount of job satisfaction when you're a nurse looking after somebody. But obviously when I took that post, um, I had no knowledge of retail and much of our income, income streams came from our shops and um, we had 15 shops at that time. So I had a very steep learning curve <laughs> to understand about leases, um, about talking to landlords, um, which would be the best shop, which wouldn't be the best shop. And um, what I realised very quickly was it's very important to have a good team around you. So if you don't know it, you find somebody that does. And um, I have now developed a fantastic team to support us in, in, in our retail operation. And we've now got, well, as I say, when I took over, we had 15 shops and we've now got 33. I'd like to see us sort of Philip Green side of me. Um, but, in, you know, a really, really successful um, and enjoyable part of what we do. I think the biggest challenge for me came with the corporate fundraising. Um, it's very much a male-dominated world. Um, 
and um, I was really very much out of my comfort zone. Um, what were my challenges? In fact, I asked one of my team, what do you think one of my challenges might have been? And they said to me, I won't say whether a man or woman said, the thing is you are rather short. And I said, well, I know I'm short. And that really was a big problem. So hence, you'll see when I stand up, I have very high heels on and always wear them. And I've become a bit of my trademark, really. And having red hair as well, because you can never sort of, you know, get into the background anywhere. So I decided um, that heels were a must and that I needed to be confident. But I must say, it remains a huge frustration of mine when I go to somewhere and I may have my team and several of them are male, people will always talk to the man first. Or they will refer to him, thinking that he's going to make the decision. So I now stand in the background and wait, and rather enjoy it, actually, as they, you know, put their foot in it and get further and further. And then they say, so who, who can make the decision? And they turn around and say, it's her. And um, there is some pleasure in that. Perhaps a bit, a bit of a sad pleasure, but I'm sorry to say that, but, it, but there is. I think... I've just learned over the years to be myself. I'm particularly disinterested in titles and always quite concerned if I have somebody in a team that is concerned about them. But I needed to take St David's forward and I think a big part of what I've learned is the art of persuasion. We have an amazing organisation and I needed to explain to people what we did because we needed to move, as, as Rosemary knows, we needed to move from the current building that we were in. There was no day hospice facility in Newport. And that became my mission for the last six years. I wrote, I talked, I tried to share the passion of palliative care and hospice care to everybody that had influence that could help us. So eventually, with a very, very kind Newport City Council, Welsh Assembly Government, we managed to tick the boxes, have the money, have the land to move forward. And many times I was asked at the beginning of that project, who's going to project manage your build? You must be paying somebody to do it. And what do you think my reply was? One, I certainly wasn't going to be paying £50,000 to somebody to project manage it. And two, I was not going to be there at the decision making. So I learnt very quickly in those few years about construction. Again, another very male-dominated world. But now, I have quite a lot of the lingo, really, around variations, and I know lots about heat under heat, uh, floor heating and various other things. But I really enjoyed that challenge, and what I found um, very good, really, was how well I was accepted into that world, even when I went on site for my very first site meeting in those famous high heels and was told I couldn't wear them, so I just opted then for a pair of Wellingtons that had a bit of leopard print on them. Um, because I wanted to keep my identity. But um, when I worked with the construction team, I found them to be an absolute pleasure. And I think they realised by that point that I had a huge passion about what we were doing. And therefore, they shared in that passion. And I think that was something that was an achievement because I said to them at the beginning of this, although this is a commercial project to you, it is not a commercial project to me. And I hope that perhaps during that process, they learnt something as well. When the build um, was complete, um, and I see it now, I look at the difference it's made to our patients. And when I go down to the day hospice, I don't go down as Emma, the chief executive. They just know me as Emma, the nurse, because that's what I want to be. Um, when I'm doing a fundraising event, and I always help out at all the fundraising events, I help out on the barbecue. You see a lot about your team. And I always work, and I would never profess to do, um, expect them to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. I've, liked, I've got to know lots and lots of people in leadership positions, but have realised that you do need, really, to get into a senior position if you really want to make a change. And one of the biggest changes um, we've made over the last few years and a service that we've developed is the Unicorn Project which had been a huge passion of mine, that we must find a service that supports the children that are facing the loss of a mum or a dad. And that service is now in its third year. And I've got funding from Children in Need, and it is really the most remarkable project. And so you really can make a difference if you strive to get into a position where you can really make a difference. I think personal experience and life experiences 
do make such a difference on your life choices. And I think it is very hard sometimes to be a woman, but I think it is important to be patient and to have perseverance. Even though I'm not the most patient of people, I do try very hard to realise that not everybody runs at my pace. I passionately would like to see um, less of a barrier between the third sector and the NHS. I think if we all work together with the current economic climate as it is, we could achieve much, much more. And I feel very privileged to be working in the position I've got and developing such um, an amazing hospice service. And although um, I can think of some obstacles and some barriers that I've faced, every time I see a patient in day hospice or I go to see them at home, some of the mums and daughters, my barriers are nothing in comparison to those facing those sort of illnesses. So that's where I come from, and I think that's what keeps me very grounded, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Emma. I think your enthusiasm for your role... change from, if you like, a, a practical basis to the business basis, albeit that you've managed to keep your hand in. But I mean, I think that's really important to know what you want to, and I think it's about being true to yourself. You said that, and I think we shouldn't necessarily be um, ashamed, if you like, to be women. I think there are occasions when we've all used that to our advantage. And I think, um, you know, one of the things, actually, I had a chat to Carmel before um, um, I came yesterday, I spoke to her, and um, she said, you know, this, this thing about you, you mustn't, you know, how you look isn't important. Actually, she said it, it is as women, that unfortunately, and I think sometimes you just have to accept some of these things and see how we can work that to our advantage as opposed to sort of getting on our high horses when say, people say things that they shouldn't about being short, which is something I get as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that was, that was very interesting. Thank you. If I can just turn to my left, on my immediate left, and um, Janet's going to speak to us next. Um, interestingly, Janet's an ex-nurse as well, but changed career paths after the birth of her daughter because she taught herself to frame pictures. I think that was probably the start of um, something very, very big. Um, she has now moved, um, well, drastically in, in the last uh, 30 years and um, now has a, a state-of-the-art um, gallery and a business here in Newport, um, which, as I understand it, the business is the only independent art house in Newport. So, Janet, perhaps you could explain your circumstances and how you got to where you are for okay. us. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll begin with a thank you for um, Rosemary's invitation. <coughs> and the lovely free lunch and all these smashing faces and um, the inspirational words that have just come before me. Um, and inter interestingly, there are some links between um, the speech that just came about nursing and caring and being a woman, obviously, is something we've all got in common here today. <clears throat> um, I started off as a nurse. Um, I wanted to be a doctor and... I didn't have anybody in high places that I could get into medical school with. I had the A-levels, but they weren't quite good enough for a council house girl to get into medical school with. Um, I became a nurse, and with absolutely no disrespect to the nursing profession, I found sometimes um, the job not to be challenging enough. Um, I carried on, I nursed, and I qualified, and I wanted to make a difference, and I felt even qualified, it was a long way off being able to make much of a difference, but I loved caring. <clears throat> um, aside from that, I then had my first daughter, became pregnant, had my first daughter, and thought I'll have a, a break from nursing. I was a qualified nurse working in a busy medical ward in Yorkshire, and I started to paint and I painted a picture of the dustbin in the yard and some turps that my husband hadn't put away and a few other delicacies that were out there. And I got it framed in a local market and it cost what I thought was a lot of money 30 years ago. And so I got a book from the library and I needed a saw and I needed a few other bits and pieces and I went and bought these things, not ever having held a saw before or and didn't know what a mitre was or... And I taught myself to picture frame, and my husband thought it was some, um, you know, 
post-birth blues or mania that I had. And um, it took me about three weeks to get the four bits of wood joining. <clears throat> and he tried one evening and managed it in about 20 minutes, and I hated him even more so for that. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's how it all began, as an accident, really. But I'd always had a massive interest in the arts when I was at school, but you could either choose between the arts and sciences, and I went along the scientific route, but the arts bit was still there. So I was, you know, a new mother in Yorkshire, ex-nurse, one frame picture, and I could cut four bits of wood with a saw, and I framed something for the lady next door. Um, she wanted a budgie from a calendar framing, and I framed it, and I thought, right, the first thing I'm going to do now, I'm in business, I'm, I'm sort of doing this, I'm going to make sure that she pays me for what I've spent, because that's what they tell you to do in business, a fundamental premise, get your money back and have something for your labor. And I thought, I need to charge her £1.50. This is 30 years ago. And she said, oh, I love that. I've made a lovely job. I must give you some money. And I thought, this is easy. I haven't had to ask. She gave me 50 pence. <laughs> and that was the first massive and one of the hardest lessons. I said, I'm sorry, it's going to have to be £1.50 doesn't cover the materials and I was dying inside saying it and she was okay and I still was dying inside but that's a hard lesson you must charge for what you're worth I think as women we undervalue ourselves far too much and we go in apologizing and we go in you know I know it's late but and I know I'm only a woman but surely that's going or gone out the window by now Anyway, moving on, I then moved to um, rugby from Yorkshire because <clears throat> my husband was a civil engineer and very ambitious. And I ended up living on a, an awful, awful housing estate in rugby where the anonymity was such that you'd go out shopping and you couldn't find which was your house. Um, the, the similarity of houses, of picket fences, and it was, for me, a sort of slow death. Um, I kept being invited to Tupperware parties. Anyone remember Tupperware parties? <laughs> and I thought, my God, these women are excited about cerise-coloured pickled onion forks. <laughs> they buy anything. And as long as they've got a list and it makes them look as though they're doing something, it's good. So I framed up everything I could get my hands on. Blackboards, poems, photographs, jokes, bits of art, anything. And I covered the wall of my house that was identical to the other thousand houses on this estate in Rugby. And I hand wrote some invitations and I went out with my buggy and my child and I put these invitations through as many doors as I could and said there's a cheese and wine and art evening happening at this house. And nearly 30 years ago, I took over 500 pounds in an evening. And that was a lot of money. And so... From this, you know, early mental illness that my husband thought I uh, was manifesting, and me, it, it suddenly had interest, and we moved then back to Wales. And any contacts I'd made on the framing front in rugby were gone, so I had to start again. By now, I had a, a better saw, and the, um, the money that had set my business up was £70 I borrowed from my mother to buy a saw and a block, and I paid her back very quickly, so I had no, no debts. Um, and I had this picture party idea, so I used to go with a mini and lots of stuff put in the back of the car and a few screens and go to houses and sell odd bits of framed art. Carried on doing that for a while, worked from home, carried on framing, was now living in Newport, so we're now 28, 29 years ago, we're living in Newport, framing from home, pregnant again. So I did stop framing now and again. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, so I'm about to have my second daughter and customers were coming to the house and a chap came there who was a director of British Alcan um, and he said to me you can't carry on working like this you know I was framing in a room I had a child kicking on a changing mat I was cutting glass over there no accidents happened but it looked dangerous but it wasn't really <clears throat> the Newport and Gwent Enterprise had just set up um, which, if any of you are familiar, is a sort of estate with lots of little units for, for start-up businesses. And I went along there with one child in school and one child of six months on my lap. And I was told by the director of Newport and Gwent Enterprise, what are you going to do with this baby? 
So there wasn't eBay then, and I didn't mention it. So I said, well, the baby goes where I go. And he said, you can't have children or pets on this site. It's a danger. I said, well, so's crossing the road, but I'm not prohibited from doing that. Change your policy. I'd like to come here. And they changed their policy, and I went there. And I was the first woman on the estate, and certainly the first woman with a, a breastfed baby on the estate. Um, and my daughter... I'm not saying there's anything wrong with childcare or nursery. It's great if, if it fits you. It didn't fit me. I wanted to see the first step and the first... I wanted to be there. So pain that it was some of the time, she came with me to work every day of her life. And her best mate was a 58-year-old engineer from one of the other units, but um, it worked. Um, I expanded from one unit on an estate to two uh, and then went from two units on the estate to buying a shop which is currently Gwent Picture Framing near George Street Furnishers on George Street there. And I've had that shop for 20-odd years and got divorced at that point um, and brought my two girls up on the merits of joining these four bits of wood together. Um, the business continued to flourish, but did a bit of that with recessions and school uniform costs and and someone once told me years ago, if ever you're in business, you must always have a few eggs in a few baskets. And I've always done that. I've car booted for food money before now and clothes money. And I'm not. And people would say, oh, business is hard, is it? I say, yeah. Um, I wouldn't car boot out of my patch. I wasn't ashamed that I'd had a hard week. Um, I was working. I was honest. And there are ups and downs in life. There are ups and downs in business. So what? It's only a game. But it's a game that you need to play intelligently, I think, and a game that you must take some gambles with, but make them intelligent gambles. Don't hurt anyone and see what happens and enjoy what you're doing. I think that's the most important thing. If you don't feel passionate about whatever it is you do, you can forget it. Because on those days when it's tough, if you're not feeling that you believe in yourself and what you do, you've got no chance. Um, Am I all right for time? Yes, yes. <clears throat> um, one little illustration of this was I was going through a very, very bad patch and I was living above the shop. My kids were little and there was nothing in the cupboards. The electricity had been cut off and I was in a state, really, but I was still having a go. And I had a phone call from the university in Newport to ask me if I'd speak to the second-year business degree students about successful businesses. And I thought, this is good. <laughs> Um, so I thought, this is ridiculous, but I'll just tell the truth. So I went along, and I sat amongst about 100 students who all had their, they were going to write things down, they were flip charts and all sorts of things, and I just had this bit of card that I'd written by candlelight. <laughs> it was all very romantic. And I told them the truth, and I said, this is how tough it gets. Tenacity, you can't have enough of it. You really can't. It's not all glamour and shoulder pads and fancy briefcases. It's just grit, grit and truth and common sense, a lot of it, and having a good idea and sussing out your market all the time, keeping an eye on what's going on, following trends, visiting whatever your field is. In my case, art, go to galleries, go to studios, see what people want, keeping your finger on the button. So I stayed in the shop, carried on framing, employed someone. Things were getting better. My girls were growing up. And that continued to give me a living. <clears throat> but I wanted another basket and another egg, so I did a, a postgraduate um, counselling course at the university, a four-year thing. So I worked three days a month at the Princess of Wales Hospital with the Macmillan team. And I enjoy that very much. And it gives a balance to the artistic side of my life. Um, because artists are very interesting and lovely people, but they can be very interested in themselves <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes it's very good to redress a balance and just see what, what life is really about. Um, eight years ago, someone came into the shop who was about 60 and said, you know, my mother wants me to talk to you. Do you want to buy some land? And this was a Tuesday morning, out of the blue, and I said, no, thank you. And she said, well, come and have a look. She took me to the lane behind my shop, and there was a derelict lane with a series of derelict buildings and cars and all sorts. 
I thought, what the hell am I doing looking at this? And I looked at it and my heart was pounding and I felt excited and I thought, a lot of artists want studio space. There isn't any provided, really, affordable studio space. So cutting it short, I bought that half a lane um, with some money I had left over from selling a house. I gave very little for it. The woman said if I'd have had half of what I had, she would have still sold it to me. She wanted me to have it. She'd watched me in my shop for many years and she was from that area and wanted some good to come to this derelict lane. I developed the lane. I worked as project manager and labourer. I can nearly plaster ceilings and do other things and I love the physical activity. Don't, don't do gyms, rather lift heavy objects. And developed the lane and it now has 15 rented studio spaces in it. Developed it in six months and it's been fully rented since it's been open. So that's going, the shop's still going. And then three years ago, I looked out the window of the shop and there was a fantastic old building up for sale, a big old church that I'd never really noticed even though I'd been there for years. Went across, had the feeling again, had the old passion, went to the building society. How about a forced mortgage? It's like, do not pass, go, do not collect 200 pounds. I thought he's going to say, on your bike, and he said, great idea, the others are working, go for it. So I have four mortgages at 58 years of age, not sensible really, um, and I've developed this old church, it's called Barnabas Arts House, um, it's got 10 studios in it, it's got performance space, um, it holds away days for businesses, the university use it for life drawing, and it seems to be working. And I've now moved my framing business into that building as well, so it's all under one. So I urge any of you in Newport, if you're around, Barnabas Arts House. Um, I can't think of much more to bore you with. That's about it. There's, there's a womanly thing to say, isn't it? Yeah, assuming I've bored you. Um, but my big, big message is believing in yourself, having a good idea. It's no good believing in yourself if you've got a rubbish idea, though. You know, there is a bit of that about, and it, it doesn't last long. You know, you, you don't need the fancy cards, cars, all of it. You just need a really good idea, a work ethic, and a sort of nutty tenacity. And if you put all those things together and be yourself, I don't think you can go far wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsty. That was lovely. And I think um, that was a very honest um, speech that you made there. And I think you're right. I think we do undersell ourselves as women. I think we probably, lots of us do that. Um, and I also like what you said about sometimes you have to take risks, but they need to be calculated. You just can't do the leap. You've got to. And it's actually right that you, you think about what you're doing, but we do need to take those risks. And I think the other thing, and I think um, Emma mentioned it as well, is it's about hard work, and, and that does pay. But I think what I think is right is that you, you're not proud too proud to do anything and I think that's perhaps again I would suggest a difference from men to women because we've all been there as you mentioned about making the tea um, you'll be very pleased to know that the senior team in Gwent Police who aren't all men obviously but um, they all make their own tea and I've actually trained them now they also wash up their cups when they finished as well which is really good but no it is about there is on a serious note it is about making sure that you know you would you you do um, I never ask so I try not to ask my people to do anything that I wouldn't do myself I think that was that was that was really lovely um, Kirsty is on uh, the far left there and uh, Kirsty's a member of the Fawcett Society and the International uh, Inter Amnesty International um, and she's two children and she is the County Councillor for Lander from Danes Court um, you're currently de de Deputy Director of the Institute of Public um, uh, Welsh Affairs rather and also uh, the Institute of Women's the Women's Affairs for the Welsh um, Institute um, and you have also served as executive member uh, for, with responsibility for health and social care in Cardiff City Council or Ca County Council and you're chair of the Women's Equality Networks in Wales. Quite a lot going on there then Kirsty. Perhaps you'd like to tell us about your experience. Thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to repeat my thanks. Thank you Rosemary. I know that this series of events has been very successful actually and uh, I think I've it's a different way of doing things in the smaller groups. I think it's a very good idea, so thank you. Um, as I said, I am Deputy Director of the IWA, a County Councillor. I'm a co-chair now of the Women's Equality Network. And I do things like sit on conservation committees and that sort of thing. Um, 
Um, but I haven't really come a traditional route, really. I've got two kids, one 17 and one 5, and as well as lots of other dependents in my family. But luckily, I've got a really large and supportive family. And what I mean by I didn't really come the traditional route, I got pregnant in school and left school and um, had an enormous chip on my shoulder, actually, because I was asked to leave school when I became pregnant. And um, then when I was later offered the grand opportunity of going back, I told oh, I said no. <laughs> politely which was a mistake as it turned out because I had to do it the hard way later but um, <coughs> and so there I was with no qualifications and a baby and I didn't really know what to do so I set up a business because I <laughs> and my teacher when I left school I had one of those very strict teachers who told me that I would come to nothing as a result of this terrible mistake I'd made in my life and I thought well okay well I'm going to do it just to spite you then because um, I have got enough vengeance in me for that. So I started a business, and it was quite successful, and I kept that going for a couple of years until I sold it. And um, so I didn't really encounter, and I think I'm going to talk, your story's really inspirational, but I think for me, I, and you'd expect this with the Equality Network background, I, I wanted to concentrate kind of on my experience as a woman doing this, but I didn't really experience any sexism because I was running my own business so I employed people but it, it wasn't re sometimes when I came into contact with suppliers and things I don't think I was aware really that I was experiencing sexism in my life um, so I had a series of disastrous relationships which kind of pushed me around Cardiff and Newport and the valleys a bit so um, my business kind of changed with it and then I started a, a different business and I, I had to deal a lot with um, takeaway owners, pub landlords, and that sort of thing, so much more in contact with men. And then I started to get an inkling, actually, that maybe I wasn't being taken seriously because I was a woman, or I was being paid late because I was a woman. And um, so that started to niggle a bit then, but I packed all that in in the end. I went to university and studied philosophy, and I intended to be a philosophy lecturer because I was sat in my office one day looking out the window, and the business was going really well, and, you know, I was having nice holidays and I had nice clothes and all that sort of stuff. And I had a kind of all the... I wasn't mega rich, but I was rich for me, for a girl from Canton. Um, I had a, kind of ticked all the boxes. I was sat out the window and I thought, oh, my God, I'm miserable. There is nothing exciting about what I do. I don't feel passionate about what I do at all. And I just watched one of these BBC doc two documentaries on philosophy. So literally, within a week, I jacked everything in, put my house on the market and started studying philosophy because it just happened to be September. So, um, and so that was what I decided I was going to do. But two things happened while I was in university studying philosophy. Well, the first one was kind of pre that, but the first one was the Iraq war and the second one was ID cards. And it, I'm not making a party political point, but these things really kind of stirred up a passion in me. And I thought, right, I'm going to read all the manifestos and decide which party I want to join. And I'm, going, I'm going to help. And... Um, I ended up joining the Liberal Democrats, which is a little bit like admitting that you decided to become a traffic warden these days. But, um, but, but it kind of um, it opened up a new world to me, and I started having debates with people and arguing with people, and kind of all the skills I'd acquired in business and being persuasive and stuff. I noticed that I started to get things done in my local community, so I decided to run for the council. And in the last year of my degree, in the second year of my degree, I found out I was pregnant again with the lovely Hiromi, and she was a wonderful surprise. So, um, and then I got elected in my third year. So I never actually finished my degree, so I'm still doing it the hard way. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing on my... I've got 60 credits to go. Um, and, and then I saw this job advertised, Deputy Director of the Institute of Welsh Affairs, and I said to my friend, I've seen this amazing job. I really want to go for it. I think I would kick ass. But I don't think I'll fit in there. I, no, 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 no. She said, well, you know, we'll give it a go. What's the worst thing that can happen? And then I got the job. And that's when, so I had kind of two weeks of elation. And I'd just been elected, but it was kind of the summer nice settling in period. And then it just felt like in September, bang, 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 bang. Everywhere I turned, because I was a woman, I seemed to be discriminated against. So all the council meetings were held at my baby's bedtime. Um, uh, childcare at the council, the first thing I did was start challenging the childcare because you got paid childcare if you had a child. That was it. So you had countless men on the council pay, getting paid childcare for 12 and 13 year old children when I'm a single mum and I've got two kids and I actually pay a childminder a fair wage. And I'm like, 
well, this isn't fair, actually. And if you've got three kids, you're getting three lots of this allowance. It was just appalling. So that was one of the first things I did. And I started asking questions then about, you know, why do I have to be out of the house every night of the week? Why can't you be a local representative and still put your kids to bed? And, um, and that's kind of until 2008. I'd never really identified as a feminist or thought that, or really thought about women's rights or really, I'd never really got into it. But all of a sudden, it just seemed like bang everywhere I looked. I remember um, being interviewed for um, an article about having been appointed at the Institute of Welsh Affairs and one of the questions they asked me was how I manage my children and my job and I just it was absolutely aghast I said well if I'd been a man would you have asked me that question you know and the other thing I used to encounter quite a lot is that um, my ex is an excellent father and people would say oh aren't you lucky though that you can work because he's so good isn't he good isn't he good and I go well no hang on a minute actually sorry because I can't remember the last time anybody congratulated me for looking after my own kids Oh, well done, well done. You, you picked your own kids up from school. Aren't you good? And I'm like, well, no. Actually, that's what he's supposed to do. <laughs> so it just seemed like very quickly I encountered all these barriers after having years and years and years of swimming through life with no barriers as a result of being a woman. So I became very kind of aware of my gender in the sphere that I was kind of operating in. And the, the place that it showed to me the most was the kind of, it was public kind of political situations like the council chamber. And it was alien to me. And I left my first two council meetings shaking. In the first instance, I thought it was fear, actually. But by kind of meeting three, it was rage. Because it's a room where men get up and try and humiliate each other in public. And sometimes women get up and join in. Now, I've seen the assembly is a much different culture than that. And I think county councils are still kind of rooted much more in the male tradition. And I've actually seen other council meetings that are a lot worse than Cardiff. And Cardiff seems very progressive, actually. But um, I think that the, the gender balance in the assembly has made a difference to the kind of nature of debate. But if you want to get up and speak in council you're invariably stood opposite somebody who's in an opposing party to you, and as you open your mouth, they'll cough or scuff their feet or drop their papers, or, and then when you start talking, they'll jeer at you. And it's, in life doesn't really prepare you for that, and it's a very kind of macho way of operating, isn't it? It's that I'm going to get one over on you in public. And the strange thing is, is that behind closed doors, in committees and with officers, and all, that, all of that goes away, and it is actually for show. And... I don't care who I'm embarrassing by saying this, because I say it a lot wherever I go. I, th I think it, it is a little bit like Jeremy Kyle, actually, the council chamber sometimes. And that was kind of the, a big barrier for me, was to learn how to operate that in that environment without getting in the ring with them. Because a couple of times I've forgotten, I've got in the ring, and I've started to act in that way too, in a kind of very playground way. And I, I do catch myself doing it sometimes and have to rein myself back. So, um, but what I can say, though, is that I've had some really good role models and women that have gone out of their way to help me along and kind of, and just outright offered me help where I was struggling or, and men as well, actually. But um, I got a mentor very early on and I work with her quite a lot. But when I was kind of reading the brief for this and I was thinking kind of how I've overcome the challenges, and to be honest, I haven't really overcome a lot of these challenges. I still work in a very male-dominated environment. And I think what I've overcome, or what I've worked out is how I deal with it. And I deal with it by challenging it. So when somebody says to me, constituents, for example, well, I would like to vote for you, Kirsty, and I know you work very hard around here, but I worry about your baby and her missing you at night, and that's terrible, you know, like this. And I challenge it. And sometimes it loses me friends, but I challenge it wherever I go because... I'm not going to have anybody telling me that I can't do all of these things and still be a mother and a daughter and that sort of thing. But um, I think actually, and this is a bit of a women's own moment now, I think the major barrier is to remember to make time for myself, to get my hair done, to go to the gym, to read a book, to spend time doing things I do. Because even though I get up on platforms and you know, rage about feminism all the time, actually I, I do kind of put everybody first the way women do. And that's a kind of big barrier. But um, I'll finish, really, on a, a story. I've got a very good friend called Trudy, who's amazing and has supported me in everything I've ever done. 
And I rang her on the way home one night, and it was at the end of year two of the childcare battle, because that's how long it went on. It just went on and on and on and on. And I ended up paying for independent legal advice because I was that adamant that I was in the right. But, um, and I was driving along, and I said to her, I said, on the hands free, obviously. I said, truly, this, this isn't fair, right? I'm fed up of being the token feminist. I'm fed up of every time I open my mouth, somebody going, oh, because he's going to bang on about women again. Actually, I think I'm going to take some time off. I'm not going to push this issue anymore because it just stresses me out. Like this. And she said, no, you're right, Kirsty, you're right, because um, it's not like you've got a platform, is it? And I was like, oof. And uh, she is right. And so that's, even though I haven't overcome most of the barriers, that's what I try and do is just keep challenging it in my life. And... Um, and I'm bringing up a little feminist. And um, she thinks that um, on her school report, so they asked her what her mum did for a living. She said she delivers leaflets, that's all she does. <laughs> and um, they asked her what she was going to be when she grew up. She said, I'm going to be a feminist like my mum. <laughs> so anyway, that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much, Rosemary, for the invite. <laughs> is that your sort of discrimination that you now have our experiences as a result of being in public life, which is what we're here about today, as opposed to, as you say, if you're in business yourself, you don't come up against those. And I do think, I mean, we haven't heard much, but I think role models are important. And again, I think uh, hopefully people in this room can see themselves possibly as putting themselves forward as mentors of various schemes that go forward. But also, you know, you are role models for people, even if you don't really realise you're role models. Be aware of when, when you're whatever you're doing, you know, that, that would be, yeah, that would be something. Um, can I now, if uh, I think we've come to the end of our sort of um, speeches, can I open now up for any questions? It would be helpful if you could just um, tell us your name and the organization you're coming from. Um, obviously, we'd like questions for the panel or for other members um, in the audience, um, but if you just have statements as well, that, that would be really, um, we'd like to hear from you. So, sorry. <laughs> There we are. Yeah. Oh, I'm not very good, but I have a go. <laughs> uh, it's a question for Kirsty, actually. Kirsty, do you ever think you're going to win your battle in your lifetime? Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Uh, thank you, Rosemary, for inviting us here today. I'm Councillor Debbie Wilcox. I'm the Cabinet Member for Culture and Leisure for Newport City Council, and I'm, in fact, in charge of this building and all the hassle about the Cryptosporidium outbreak a couple of weeks ago, plus all the other things. I went to a meeting last week with the 22 other local authorities, and I was the only woman Cabinet Member there. The other 20 were men. I think there is one other woman, Merrill, down in Carmarthen, but she didn't come to the meeting. And out of the 22 officers, only two officers were women, 20 were men. Um, and it's about that battle that we face, and it's about doing things differently. I think the Assembly has been an absolute game changer in the way women are perceived in public life and in political life. But we've got a long way to go. Um, I missed getting into the Assembly by 300 votes last time. I had 82,699, but I was 300 short. And that's the battle, because I can get on lists, but I can't get selected. And last time, it was really noticeable that all the women who was elected in 99 with Rosemary, when they resigned their seats, they were then, men, were, men was then selected. So in the political forum, things have changed thanks to people like Rosemary, but we've still got a long way to go. And we, we, you know, we've got to get through those perceptions that women do things differently, maybe better than men, maybe not as well as men, differently, but we work together. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Newport Centre today. The pool is filling up, and next week we'll be back in action. Thank you. I'm Janet Pinter from the University at Newport. And I wonder what your thoughts are, because wherever um, in public life, to some extent, although the Assembly, I agree, has been very good at, at raising the profile of women, wherever you kind of look, whether it be the NHS, whether it be education, um, women tend to have done very well in reaching management roles, but still, over, almost, I think, without exception, and please inform me if I'm wrong, 
in senior management and ultimate decision-making roles, there is still, there's still the glass ceiling there. It still exists. And I wonder if, if any of you have got any thoughts on how that, uh, how, how we can kind of break through what, what remains of the glass ceiling. Um, yeah, I, I have got some thoughts on it, actually, and I think it's to, a lot to do with merit, and it's the same in politics. I think that um, we've got a merit-based system, but merit is decided on a set of skills that actually aren't natural or convenient for women. So, for example, if you want to get to the top of an organisation, it's a good idea to stay at a desk till 7 or 8 o'clock so that you can demonstrate what a good employee you are and how committed you are. But actually, as I said to um, the chair of my organisation recently to a raised eyebrow, that I think that's rather poor management if you can't finish your work by five o'clock and that you need to really look at your time management skills if you can't finish in that time. And that's a demonstration of a lack of being able to control your calendar rather than commitment to the organisation. But that isn't kind of, and right the way across, so in public life, you know, the ability to be able to get up and outsmart your opponents at will, that kind of thing, all these things that we judge as merit in corporations are things that don't come naturally to women so I, d I don't know how we're going to do it but we need to kind of change the society's view of merit and what value people bring to organizations and i think a really good place for that is trade unions actually but that, that's my bet i think one of, one of the things that, that, that that's happening is that those softer um outcomes are, are being even more undervalued um, and I don't quite know how that involves, well, that will in impact on women and women's role uh, in business and public life. But because we're kind of being a much more targeted society with the harder outcomes set in everything, it's just a thought that, uh, yeah, in my experience, it's the softer outcomes that are being undervalued. But that's just a comment. Um, yeah, I, I just, Emma, to add to that, I, I'm not really, I'm not sure I totally agree, actually. I think, I think a lot of it for... I mean, I, when I did that piece of work looking at the health board chairs and chief execs, for example, actually, if you looked underneath, so you're absolutely right, when I was looking at each website, um, many of the other senior positions were women, because particularly in nursing and medicine, um, particularly in nursing, a lot of senior nursing positions are women. I mean, I think the difficulty is, whilst um, and women, the minute they go on maternity leave, I think it does put them at a disadvantage. And I think it is being at the right place at the right time. And I think those, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, but I know a lot of my colleagues that are in senior positions of chief execs, most of them have been like me and have never had any time off work. And that's the challenge, really. And if you go to a place, you know, place like Norway, where they give um, the same um, maternity leave, exactly the same as maternity leave, then you may have a more equal footing. But whilst it stands, I mean, I took, what, 18 weeks off. Um, which is nothing, and then went back full time. And that would be seen, and then when in sort of 16 years ago, that was really frowned upon. You know, I would be going to these terribly lovely little baby things, and they'd be saying, "What are you doing next week? Are you coming?" No, I'm going back to work full time. You know, and that wasn't that wasn't um, encouraged. That wasn't encouraged. So I'm very unusual to do 40 years in the NHS um, as a woman. is is not normal full time. And I think that's a huge problem. Until we can get maternity and maternity leave the same, then we might put um, in more an even keel, I think. Can, can, I, can I come perhaps back on, on your question as well about how you, you know, how you, uh, if there is this glass ceiling or perceived ceiling. I, I mean, I'm, I'm um, a little bit with Emma on this in that um, I did exactly the same. I didn't have any time off, but I took a conscious decision to do that because I decided that I could actually, where I was, I could, I thought I could just see a, a way forward. Actually, things went completely differently afterwards. But I think, and I was also very, um, ha I had a very, very supportive husband as, and, and, and I did have a family network. So I took advantage of all of that. And, and again, I wasn't sort of afraid to say that. But I think the point that Kirsty makes about long hours, you know, if you're not there, it does put people off. But I think a lot of it's about potentially, or what, your, what are your views on when is that die cast? In terms of women, I think it's, you see, I think it's right back from when you're there in school and, and certain stereotypes that sometimes that they're given. I, I've, I'm, I'm the mum of two very successful daughters who, you know, haven't suffered, I don't think anyway, as a result of me being a full-time um, working mum. But at the end of the day, they know their own minds, that they've always been brought up with that you can do anything you want um, within reason. 
Um, but they've worked very hard at it. And I think there's, I, I wonder whether there is anything more, again, that we can do. I mean, I, you know, in terms of in, encouraging youngsters, and I mean, obviously, being part of the university, that, is there more that we could do about, you know, events like this, I think, to sort of speak to people who are making those choices in terms of where they're going to go? It may not be academic, it may be practical, about things that they need and, and ta um, strategies for dealing with the sorts of things that Kirsty has come across in, you know, in in this day and age, and I think that is, I had the same question, but I'm going back 24 years when I was told, wasn't it better for me to have stayed at home to look after my children? Um, and that was in, in, in a council, which I thought possibly had moved on now, but that's, that's quite shocking. Uh, just to really quickly add to that, I think what I, I find myself actually acting casually sexist in my own home all the time, and I think that we do in society all the time. So, for example, um, somebody sent me an article the other day, and until I read it, I didn't realise that more or less every day of her life, I tell my daughter how beautiful she is. Well, I didn't raise my son telling him he was beautiful every day. So, um, so and, and I think we do that all the time. So this, this sounds very kind of um, radical, but I think we need to start challenging it in our own homes so that our children aren't being brought up to, you know, she's beautiful and he's not. They did an experiment in America somewhere where they got the same baby and a pink baby girl and they walked 100 people through the room and they all interacted with it and left and then they got the same baby with a blue baby grow and they were all rougher with the blue baby and gentler and aren't you pretty with the pink baby and I think until we get right at that because we're doing it in our homes and in our schools and right the way through society and in advertising and the media so I think that's the place to start. Yeah, I wonder if you could pursue that a little about choices at school. And it's not so much the choices of the subjects you take, but the approach you're given. I went to an all-girls school, and therefore we had to have scientists, we had to have artists. My, both my daughters went to mixed schools, and they all studied art, because the boys did the sciences. Uh, there is someone here from the training council, I think. Yeah, from the, no? Building, building trades or construction? Oh, right. Sorry, I thought you said roof training. That's right. <laughs> no, right no, okay. Um, but I, I did meet someone last week at a, a fantastic Asian wedding, and it was seriously bling. It was glorious. And this, this vision came up, and she's at university, and she's studying engineering. And it was such a shock to everybody that this glorious woman was studying engineering that we're now going to use her as a role model. But I think it is this perception about, you know, you're a girl, therefore you do these things, and boy, therefore you do boys things and I just wonder whether anybody else particularly um, um, I don't say the older the less young amongst us might have noticed that in school uh, anybody any comments on that Um, they, they have an engineering conference which is held up at the Celtic Manor and I actually went up there and out of interest I walked around to see how many girls were involved in the project and of, um, I think there were probably about 40 schools there, there were, I would say, 82% um, were boys and of the 18%, is that my maths right? 18% left, the girls there, there was a huge percentage of, of Asian children, girls, rather than just the, the, the UK, well, that, that, that's the wrong way to say it, but do, do you know what I mean? It was, so there's obviously a swing that they were thinking that that was where the route to go. Why? Girls are just as good at engineering and physics as ma and maths. I'm not upsetting you by saying that, am I? <laughs> do, do, you, do you see that? I mean... I think... Well, I, not the engineering thing so much. Of course I see that. Um, the number of people I've had in the early days, I think 30 years ago, women doing jobs which were considered male, like holding up any sort of tool to use was considered male. It really was, you know, and what what's a person like you holding a saw for? You know, I used to get people in the shop. Have a word with the boys out the back when they make this frame. Have a word with the boys when they cut this glass. It's it's it was so the gender differences were so great then that in thirty years I think there's been quite a shift. Thank God. But I think there's still 
there is still a way to go. And I think the stuff that Kirsty said was really um, pertinent. The isn't that good, you know, that you've got a male partner that picks the kids up. I've, I've got a brother-in-law that was made a, a widower at 32, and it was tragic. Three children under five. Um, and he's managed, and those children are all, you know, up, off and at university now. But he's had lots and lots and lots of acclaim for bringing his children up and working. And so he should, so should any human being, but he's had extra, extra brownie points because of his genitals, really. You know, what's that got to do with it? <laughs> what's that got to do with it? What's that got to do with anything? There's still a huge focus. And the other thing that bugs me is when I hear people using their femininity. I think that is, is equally disgusting. I find it quite disgusting. I mean, I've been to some, again, 20 years ago, business women network meetings. Nothing to do with anything that you've ever done, Rosemary, but other sorts, Dallas sorts. And they were Dallas sorts. There wasn't a businesswoman in the room. There wasn't a woman who, you know, hadn't, I, there just wasn't. Th these were people, these were women who were dressing up as business people. And there, I think amongst women, amongst many women, there is the businessman and the businesswoman. But the bus it, there's this, this, this way of dressing, way of being, way of... And it, it's taking its time to dissipate, I think. It's happening, but it's not completely gone amongst women and men. Carmel had been here today, um, as, you, as you know, I haven't mentioned actually, but in Gwent, you're very fortunate because obviously Carmel, we have a, a lady chief constable, and I'm the chief executive, and in fact our chair of the police authority, Mrs. Silla Davis, so we are, we, are, um, we are there in terms of Gwent, in terms of this particular service. Um, but one of the things that struck me when I first went to that service is, it is I mean, it is clearly a very male-dominated organisation, um, but actually... Um, I think having um, a, a, a woman at that senior level, and, and Carmel was Deputy Chief Constable for a number of years in Gwent previously, she, she does promote um, the, the, the movement of w women within the service, and particularly taking on um, uh, uh, officers. Unfortunately, we're not, they're not recruiting at the moment, but for example, they've just taken on a, a large number of um, police uh, community support officers with funding from the Assembly, and she made a conscious decision that part of what she wanted to do was to actually have part-time posts for part of those to enable, first of all, to have people on duty when they needed to be, but also to enable people who wanted to get back into work, which does tend to be for women, because the idea being is that if you become a community support officer, it will be when we start recruiting, hopefully, um, a line in in terms of uh, police recruitment. And the other thing is, and I got the figures yesterday, because I asked um, to find out what, what rank, female ranks, you know, where there were senior people, because obviously Carmel has told, held the post of chief and deputy but um again we've got um, a chief a, a, a detective chief superintendent who's a woman at senior level we've got a local uh, chief inspector who's the head of the unit in um the command unit in, in monmouthshire um we had an inspector who headed up the armed response unit until she got promoted um and we have a sergeant in the dog section so and and we we do have chief inspectors and inspectors in the vulnerable uh, people's unit so um I think there is some movement in that, but I, I, I go back to what was said earlier. It was about having people at that senior level, women in the senior level, making that, that effort. And, and I think probably it is more difficult um, if you are surrounded, as we tend to be with men, to actually sort of keep going at that. But I think probably we've got a responsibility to do that. And I think with the work that the Assembly are doing in terms of, as I said, promoting, I think that um, you know, hopefully in, in due course we will make some, some difference. Um, but that, 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 I think that's where we are. Has anybody else got? Yes, a young lady. Um, my name is Angeline Chiani. My name is Angeline Chiani. I'm from Newport, uh, B, uh, the Newport BME Residence Housing Forum. And I'm also chair of the Batanai Bambanani Women's Network Wales in Newport. Not the Dallas type, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, what it is, um, we, there is a perception that uh, black women or ethnic minorities uh, in Wales in particular 
um, find it very difficult to, um, I can't say integrate, but to, to find themselves in positions, you know, in, in, in high uh, uh, positions at, at work or just getting jobs in particular, you know, let's say um, high-flying jobs. So most women find themselves in jobs like cleaning, n well, I shouldn't say nursing really because nursing, for me, it's, 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 it's a high-flying job. But they find themselves in jobs that they would not really particularly want to be in because of their skin color. And I say it's a perception because um, I hear a lot of it going on, but I don't see women really particularly striving or going for these positions because of that perception, one. And two, um, I don't know whether there are any programs that are particularly designed for the BME community to get into position, into high positions at all in any particular, uh, in any sphere of, of, of uh, um, employment. That's, that's my main question actually. Are there any programs that are designed for BME women to get into you know, uh, high positions at all? Especially directed to Kirsty Davis. What are your experiences of BME women trying to get into high um, positions at all in Wales? Um, yes, yeah, so well, I, would, I would agree. Certainly in my party, when you look at the gender makeup, it, it's not quite even. And then when you look at the, um, the diversity amongst the women, we're not that diverse, actually. We've got a candidate in Cardiff South and Panath at the moment, Bablin Mollock, who's doing very well, and she's a wonderful woman. In terms of BME-specific programmes, I'm not sure, although quite tag minds, it's something that I'll, I'll look up. Um, Oh, what was the other part of your question? Sorry. Sorry. Oh, th that's, that's what I was going to say. But there is a program called um, the Women Making a Difference Project, and it isn't specifically designed for BME women, but a large percentage of the participants are BME. So they've got quite, kind of, quite a lot of expertise. And I personally know quite a few women who've come through that program and gone on to do amazing things. Brilliant. Well done. My name's Kay Murray, I live in Killeen and I set up the Lodge Coffee in Delhi two and a half years ago, um, previously a business support manager for an international recruitment company, so quite different. Um, I'm actually the director and I, I know Janet, we've spoken before about how hard it is in business. Um, my husband actually works for me, um, there's, there's no bother, Rosemary knows, he wanted to give up his job and work for me and I sort of thought, well, hang on, I've put all the work into this, fine, you want to give up your job but you can come and work for me, which he does. Um, it was quite interesting and I related to Kirsty probably the most. Um, when I set up, because I had a master's degree in business and I had obtained that within I think five years, there was a programme um, whereby I could um, get some money from the local council. It was a thousand pounds to set up a website. Um, so of course, ev every little helps. Um, very helpful, Dani Fisher, I'm, sh I'm sure a few of you know her, um, help, help, with the biz um, help with the business side of things. Um, there was a payback to that, which was, can 22 councillors come to your business um, and have coffee? Fine. Um, they'll be asking you questions and you might have to do a presentation. Okay, so I was quite excited. I was thinking, okay, you know, I'm reasonably young. I've set up my business. I'm quite proud. I expected the men, I expect, sorry, I expected the 22 to be mostly men, absolutely. And I probably expected them not to be my generation, actually. So there's some assumptions on my part there. Um, but I was quite excited. I thought, okay, they're going to see me. I, I'm blonde. I've got the red lipstick, and they're going to make an assumption. But actually, when they asked me some questions about my business and about how I project managed it, how I financed it, they'll see through that, and you know, I can prove that I'm, you know, I'm as good as they are. Um, I didn't quite get the, the opportunity to do that, and, and I was thinking about you saying, you know, kind of getting in the ring, um, because they came in. Um, I think there were 22 councillors. I think only two at the time were female, and both were. 
our ward in Killian, which was interesting. Um, I tried to tell them how to order their coffees. None of them wanted to listen to me, so they all just went and sat down and started shouting out, latte, americano. Um, so it was absolute chaos. Um, and when it came to the question and answer session, there actually weren't any questions. I was actually told, you know, move your cheese from by there, love. No one wants to look at cheese through the window. Pop some cakes in there instead. Um, and I was absolutely furious, and I thought, no, okay, I'm, like you said, I'm, I'm not going to get in the ring with this. I'm actually going to um, explain myself and say, our USP is actually the deli. There are lots of coffee shops. We're a USP. We're doing lots of other things like book exchange, you know, student cards. And I, I thought, no, I'm going to really tell him why I've done this and all the great things we're doing. I didn't get a chance because he just kept going, nope, nope, nope. Move, move the cakes there, move the cakes there. And it was such an infuriating experience, actually. Um, that, but I, can, I, I really admire you. And, and actually, at the time, I did think to myself, um, I'm going to contact Rosemary, and I'm going to get involved in local politics. I thought, I'm going to do this, bugger it. And, I, and, I, and looking at you today, I just thought, I didn't do it. I made excuses. I thought, you've just set up a business. You can't leave David to do this because he won't do it the way that you want to do it. And I made every excuse possible not to contact Rosemary and sort of get involved locally. And then listening to you, I just thought, I probably should have done that. And if I haven't by now, I, I, I probably should because um, definitely I think, you know, women and, and younger women are totally re underrepresented. Um, and we perhaps do have a different dynamic to add to the group and to shake it up a little bit. So um, probably like yourself, I don't necessarily see it in um, a commercial workplace because I think you're quite strong and, and independent, and I think I am as well, but particularly when it comes into the public sector, you can really see that you just kind of get pushed down and, and dismissed a, a bit. So I, I think, you know, you're really inspirational, Kirsty. so well done. Do you mind if I actually do you mind if I just follow up on something? that yeah, follows no, on from that. Yeah. Um, I was actually, for my sins, elected as a community councillor years ago. And um, I was really enthusiastic because I thought I can really do something. I'm a doer. Um, and I went along to the meetings and I got told to put my hand up every time I wanted to ask um, a question. Um, I got told off for talking when the chair was actually talking. And they were all much, much older than I was, gentlemen. And whenever I suggested something, I was told, no, we don't do that. Um, why, why, why don't you do that? Because we can't. Why can't you? Because we tried it once before and we can't do it again. Or because you just don't do it like that. And I have to say, I gave up. Rather than carrying on and fighting for what I believed, I just threw my toys out of the pram and left. And I, I'm gutted I did because that's such a shame because... All the men, another man took my place. So. I, I think that sort of really, uh, I think, if, is there, a, yes, sorry, can I? Can I just tell you a little bit of a story? Oh, oh sorry, I'm, yes, I'm Nina Finnegan, I'm from the Share Centre, the chief executive there. Um, Oh, many years ago, uh, I was a mature student at St Andrews University, which is a very posh university. And, you know, I was a single parent, never been married, and, uh, you know, had a few kids. And I was there as a mature student from a working class background. But I really, really enjoyed my degree. Um, I did marine biology, which was traditionally a male area, but there were four, four women in the class and no men. It was great. So I decided that I would become student president and get another year at university as a sabbatical. So I stood. There'd never been a woman president before. And so I thought, well, it's about time there's a, a woman president from a working class background, you know, a socialist, um, standing uh, for, excuse me, sorry, I've got a bit of a sore throat, for St. Um, St. Andrews University. So the smear campaign started from all of the male candidates. And they were all about the fact that I was a woman and I was a single parent and from my background. But a bit of good news, I actually became the first woman president <laughs> of St. Andrews University, despite them all. Ladies <laughs> and 
hate these things. Um, I just, my name's Vori Manson, um, and I'm here as Vori Manson. I happen to work inside the health service. Um, I just wanted to just say a little bit about what, what has helped me achieve my potential. Um, and in a sense, it's about having, I think Kirsty spoke about it, actually having somebody who gives you time to talk through um, strategies for getting where you want to or um, strategies around personal development or building your skills and competencies and just the importance of having a mentor um, who voluntarily gave time to help somebody else. Um, and I think as groups of women, I think it's a really good um, reflective question to ask ourselves, what do we do to help other women develop their personal potential? Because with all the fancy things you know, that we can put in place, it's actually about how we as women don't draw up the bridge after ourselves. Because believe you and me, I've worked with very many women who've done that. Um, who might have reached the pinnacle of wherever, but have made sure that nobody else follows behind them. So I think just the, the importance of really cost-effective programs of mentoring. I'm mindful of um, the program that Craig and colleagues of his ran, um, the Step Up Cymru program, because it's not just about women. It is about <coughs> the greater diversity in our communities. Um, and certainly having ordinary people... Um, scrutinise the health service has actually improved many, many services much better than having, with respect, lawyers or other professional people, just the reality of people's lives. So <coughs> that's... There's, a, could it, there's a lady up front. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah. Um, 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 uh, I think that the people who are in the panel are in the panel. And I think that the people who are in the panel are in the panel. And I think that the people who are in the panel are in the panel. And I think that the people who are in the panel are in the panel. On the men sure are pretty or no, or so it na lay, e dravod materion, merched, mon, um, civil spouth, orioli, um, a gethany, a hedigo scores in a cavarodina, and ang lina oit hen in buisig, I paid ya, and genadol, do meddle wathe, board on buisig, am a pressem and my curse, stewardison, am Danabo, a demane, and dal, or twinebiad, with your dan, or winneb. See them bob amser an amlog um, a rologansa belema do di cal saul sefyll felly um, ma y dynion yn fy nghwmni fi wedi cymeryd arnyn nhw hynna yn y rôl o fod y prifweithredwr a fi yn sefyll tyn ôl yn yn fysgidiau uchel a fy ngwallt coch yn disgwyl i rwy'n ofyn bi o dwi'n neud. Um, Ond i eisiau dweud just tri peth. Um, un ydy... Um, Dwi'n meddwl bod ni'n ffodus yng Nghymryd. Ni'n diolch yn fawr iawn i Rws, mae'n ymwneud y cyfle i ni gael y math yma'r drafodaeth. Um, mae gynna ni gyfle i gael sgyrsio fath gwahanol. Um, er fod yn y fwy o ferched mewn um, swyddi um, o ddylanwad yng Nghymru na goedd na, mae'n edal ethos sydd yn gallu trin merched mewn ffordd gwahanol yn trafod i'w personoliaeth nhw yn hytrach na i'w cyfraniad nhw ac yn gallu tôn amdana chi fel The Fairy Redded neu The Welsh Bwdysia neu beth bynnag y pan da chi byddai nhw ddim yn wneud y math yno sylw am ddynion yn yr un i'n ffordd. Un o'r pethau ddigwyddodd ar yn bwrdd ni sydd rôl ni gyrraedd bore yma 
oedd gwneud cysylltiadau hefo'n gilydd gweld be gall um, y ddwy ferch yn fynyn um, wneud hefo'i gilydd drwy jys, cael sgwr sydyn. Ac wneud os y meddwl ynglyn ar heriau sydd y wynebu Cymru rwan. Ac un o'r pethau sy'n rhaid i ni wneud yn well ydy gweithio mewn partneriaeth. Um, ac y, gallwn ni ddim sefyll yn, 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 yn sefyllfoedd ac amddiffyn byd â ni wneud. Mae'n golygu bryd nefod lots mwy o weithio mewn partneriaeth sy'n golygu rhoi drwbeth a gwneud i beth eraill symud yn fwy ystwyth. A dwi'n dweud y meddwl os oes gen merched sgili os i'n wneud hwnna yn llai um, um, yn, yn haws, ac yn, a bod ni'n ni gweld o creu mor heriol a mae ma dynion yn draddodiadol wneud i hwnna'n rhywbeth rhy stereotypically ddweud. I, I think... Um, your, your comments are very pertinent, and I think that there are there are issues around stereotypes, which I think you know we've all, um, and, and I think that is something that again you know it's only us to some extent that can actually deal with that. And I think perhaps Rosemary, you, you know, I've picked up a couple of things that perhaps we could um, ask your team to look at in terms of the final reports and recommendations. I think mentoring. I know there have been various schemes, but I think that would be something that a lot of us would be interested in. And the networking, I think, is important. Um, and particularly, not only networking, but having a forum, whether it's this sort of forum or something similar that you know we meet and that we can actually then bounce ideas off. And I think, as you said, because we probably most of us have went to base, I expect here. You know, um, I don't know many of the ladies in this room. Whereas actually, we might be able to forge some good relationships working together. And I think that you know, I think that's a really good, um, perhaps a good positive note where we could, um, perhaps we could finish on that point. Has, has anybody got any other points they want to raise? Perhaps I could hand back over to Rosemary. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Excuse me. Um, well, uh, it is a case to follow that then. Um, thank you very much. It's been, I think, really quite inspirational. And I think what we have to do in Wales is to celebrate our diversity. We're just three million people, but we've got a whole range of people. But this year, I'm concentrating on women. Uh, we are over 50% of the population. Uh, we're not better than man, men, we're just very different. Uh, and it's quite interesting that we've had a, an in inspirational panel today, as we have at each of the events across Wales. I've been quite in awe of the people. But the thing that's come out today, both e the three, Emma, Janet and Kirsty, have all mentioned passion. And I think that's it. You know, you've got to feel that passion and you've got to move forward uh, and, and take it with you. But um, what, I, what we're trying to do here is not about political with a capital P. We don't women necessarily in political parties, although that would help enormously. What I'm looking at as well is people with a small P, you know, getting out, putting head above the parapet, becoming um, a magistrate, a school governor, and importantly, becoming chief executives because, you know, you need people in a position of power or influence to actually make the right decisions um, and, and I think that's what I I mean I talk to lots of conferences and, and, and this is a, quite a generalization but it's generally true you go to a conference where it's men with gray flannel suits and it's a strategic conference really important conference then you go to another conference is all women or mainly women and those are the people who are going to put those strategies into practice they don't actually make the strategies they get on and do the work uh, and, and that is generally how things are. But, uh, you know, as we said, it is changing. It's just, ju just not changing quickly enough. <laughs> and we have to look at whether it's schools, whether it's parents, the pink baby, the blue baby, you know, the fact that you buy toys, um, dolls for the girls, and a whole range of things you do actually influence. But there are some incredible women um, in, in Wales, and, and there are a lot of ordinary women doing extraordinary things. And the point was made about don't pull the ladder up behind you, hold your hand out, just give somebody a helping hand. Uh, lots of questions come today. We'll try and get answers, uh, particularly about getting uh, black and ethnic mi minority women into uh, mainstream. Because if you haven't met uh, Angeline and her, her girls, I tell you what, you've missed something. Because they're from Zimbabwe, they've come to a different country, and they really are making a difference. Uh, and they're raising money here to send back to Zimbabwe to sponsor hospitals and build hospitals, you know. So they really um, are, are quite incredible. And that kind of resource we can't afford to waste as a nation. So I'd just like to say thank you very much to our panel. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank particularly Shelley for stepping in and chairing it in, in, a, in an incredible way. It's very difficult. And then to put it together at the end has been really, uh, I think, quite exceptional. So thank you very, very much. Um, 
And this word passion has, has, has come across. And uh, young people don't actually see barriers so much these days until they have children. And that's when the barriers come in, uh, you know, childcare. And I mean, I, when I got in the authority, uh, Newport City, Newport Borough Council, as it was then originally, um, <coughs> there were things like they didn't, you didn't get paid at all as a council then unless you were working. And if you worked, you were given money to compensate the shift that you weren't doing. And being, you know, a mother who didn't have a job, I didn't get paid anything. But I did, did feel I had to have somebody look after my child, pick my child up from school, and I thought, well, perhaps the council would pay for it. <laughs> um, we had to have a full debate in council and a motion, which I'm sure is in a minute somewhere, that I would be allowed to claim 50p to pay my friend to pick my child up from school. And that's how things have moved since, you know, on since then. Um, but it did occur to me that um, a bit of passion was actually started me on the road to where I am now. And that's because I had two small children. I used to go to the park and there was nowhere to sit, nowhere for the mother to sit. And in those days we had park keepers. And if you're over 14, they didn't allow you to sit on a swing. So you had to stand up all the afternoon. And I tried to get a bench, and they were all male councillors, and I, you know, they didn't understand the importance of this bench. And then there was an election, and I thought, well, I would stand. And as well as wanting better education and lovely leisure facilities, I would say I want a bench in the park. Uh, and the idea was to embarrass the other candidates, so when they became councillors, they would give us a bench. But it didn't work out like that. I won the, I won the election. <laughs> And it's thanks to my bench. Um, I got the bench within four weeks. It is still there. Um, the play equipment is now gone. So this bench is now isolated in a field all on its own. Um, but I think it's, it's important that the passion is that you, once you get something that makes you really mad, then you get up and you do something about it. Um, so what I'm trying to encourage people here today is to hold a hand out to somebody else. If you know a young person, a young woman who wants to do an evening class, she hasn't got a babysitter, offer to babysit, offer to mentor them. Uh, and if you've got you know, women working with you, just give them that bit of a helping hand. You know, they, they, it's, they want confidence. And I think the point we, we heard earlier on, I think Kirsty was saying she thought she would never apply for this job. But the, the, you know, the average man will apply for a job he can do 50% of. Whereas an average woman will only apply for a job she can do 90% of. And there's a big, big difference there. So it's, you know, you just trying to give people this confidence. And, you know, we want PTA, we want school governing bodies, we want magistrates, a whole range of things. But, of course, what you need to do is to make sure that women are in the position where they can actually make the decisions. So a lot has come from this today and from the previous events. And we will be having a conference in November in Cardiff. And I hope you'll come along where I'm hoping that we will get a motion from there which will actually you know, spur the assembly into doing something. But things like, there are lots of mentoring uh, organizations, but they're either professional women or they're you know, specific to a, a specific kind of job. So it might be that we can look at having you know, mentoring groups in different parts of Wales. Um, just so you can come along and, and talk. And, and if you don't say anything, it does, you know, consolidate your thoughts and think, yeah, I can actually do this. And so it's interesting to see the spread of ages here today, and I think it's really great. But today is um, National Poetry Day, so I thought I'd read you a poem, which has actually been written, was written, uh, by the winner of the Newport Women's Forum Bursary Award. Uh, this was a young lady who's got cerebral palsy, and she wanted to print some of her poems, so she applied for some money and she won it. And this is one of the poems that she wrote. Well, she did write it specifically for the award ceremony. It's called Unsung Heroes. Pamela da Vinci was Leonardo's wife. Forgotten by the art world, she helped him all her life. She sat and mixed his colours, each subtle blue and green. And yet, twas her, and not twas him, designed the submarine. Columbus had a daughter. Clarissa was her name. She had all the bright ideas, while he had all the fame. She said there was a shining land beyond the foaming sea, and he went forth to look for it, as proud as proud could be. Brunel, who built the railways, the bridges and the dams, idolised his mother, who worked for Hartley's jams. He watched her as she stoned the plums, such skill and such precision. He said, I'll be an engineer. It was a good decision. And so it is with every man of consequence and worth, in every age and every clime, throughout the whole wide earth. A woman has inspired them in castle, tent, or barn. The same with Saint Augustus, and the same for Genghis Khan. A thousand unsung heroines who lived and were forgotten, but none of them will feel aggrieved, though we might think it rotten. 
For though they lived obscure lives, surrounded all in mystery, they knew, for better or for worse, that they shaped the course of history. And I just think that's lovely. Just as, in, as it's National Poetry Day, I thought I'd give you that treat. But can I just say thank you so much for Kirsty, Janet, Shelley, and Emma for all they, for what they've done for us today. I think Janet didn't mention that she did all that work and all that development without a grant from anybody, because she applied for the grants, but she had to wait until she got the grant before she could start building. And being Janet, being Janet, she didn't do that. She did it the other way. So she'd done it without a penny of public money, which I think is quite, quite exceptional. So thank you very much, and thank you so much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. I would like to thank Newport Centre for their hospitality. We've had sandwiches everywhere else. So uh, in Newport, we actually had uh, hot food. Uh, and I'd like to thank our interpreter, translator, translator, interpreter, translator. I always get it wrong. Uh, and, and thank you very much for, for the help and organization. So thank you very much. I hope to see you in November. And please, you don't have to leave. You can sort of chat amongst yourselves. Johan Bauer. Cynulliad Cenedlaethol Cymru yw'r corff sy'n cael ei ethol yn ddemocrataidd i gynrychioli buddiannau Cymru a'i phobl, i ddeddfu ar gyfer Cymru ac i ddwyn Llywodraeth Cymru i gyfrif. I gael rhagor o wybodaeth ac i ganfod pwy sydd yn eich cynrychioli, ewch i cynulliadcymru.org neu gallwch chi'n dilyn ar Facebook a Twitter. The National Assembly for Wales is the democratically elected body that represents the interests of Wales and its people, makes laws for Wales and holds the Welsh Government to account. For more information and to find out who represents you, go to assemblywales.org or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.